The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. Okay, we are exactly uh, one, two, three more lectures before the exam. Exam is next Wednesday, right? Uh, today, here's what we're going to do. Remember the uh, derivation? Uh, most of you slept through it. Do, anyone remember the derivation? Remember it? You know, we derived a lot of stuff, you know. Anyway, so we'll, we'll pick up there. Uh, it will lead to certain simplifications. We will talk about that. Okay? And then we're going to do problems. And in particular, we're going to do rolling. Now, rolling um, is introduced in dynamics usually as a case all of its own. And I hate that, right? Because to me, it's just another example of dynamics, OK? And um, uh, I think I should take my cell phone off. Uh, it's another case of dynamics. It's another case of a kinematic constraint. And I don't like to treat it as any special uh, behavior. Rolling is just basic dynamics. Everything we've done, I want you to see it as a powerful technique that you can apply to any situation, and rolling is just a special case. I hate this kind of special treatment of rolling. OK? All right, so today we're going to do ugly, pick up where the ugly equation left off, simplify, do problems. Wednesday, unfortunately, I'll be in Brazil. Yep, Sao Paulo. What? Birthplace of uh, Ayrton Senna. Any Formula, Formula One fans here? Ayrton Senna, remember him? I'm going to go to his gravesite. That's kind of my. Uh, I'm, that's not why I'm going to Brazil. I'm going to Brazil because I'll, I have worked there. But I'm going to go to his memorial because I'm a big Formula One fan. Anyway, um, so I, I won't be here. But we're actually beautifully set up to do something that I, I, I'd announced. That remember I said right in the beginning that I, the first class I did by video. This is the other one that I couldn't get out of this trip. Uh, so we've arranged, but we're in perfectly in in time. Um, if I had to do a lot of content on Wednesday, I'd have requested one of my colleagues, one of my uh, faculty colleagues, to teach. But as it turns out, this is just right for problems. So what we're going to do on Wednesday, I'll be doing a bunch of problems today, and then Ajay's going to do a bunch of other problems, and he's going to introduce the concept of energy in rigid bodies. Just like in, uh, in uh, regular uh, point particle masses, you have kinetic energy and potential energy in uh, rigid bodies you get kinetic energy and potential energy. Potential energy remains the same in rigid bodies. You just take the center of mass, take its height, that's the potential energy. Okay? The only thing that changes is kinetic energy. And kinetic energy, in I'm telling you right now, has two terms in rigid bodies. Half mv squared, where v is the velocity of the center of mass, plus, what's the other term? Half i omega squared. Only works for certain reference points about which you take the i. That we'll get to today. Okay, so he's going to do that and then just do a bunch more problems. And then I will come back on, uh, I'll be back Friday. And uh, on Monday, I'll do more problems. And your exam's on Wednesday. Are you folks interested, would you like me, um, Ajay and me, to do an informal review on Saturday? Yes? Let's nail it right now. 3 p.m.? 3 p.m. 3 p.m., here's what Ajay and I are going to do. This is not formal, all right? Ajay and I will happen to be here at 3 p.m. I'm sure the rules were breaking. I have no idea. I don't care. We'll be here at 3 p.m., just shooting the breeze, you know, just kind of chatting. And if you guys show up, we'll chat with you for an hour. Okay, 3 to 4, Wednesday, uh, Saturday, this room. Ajay, can you talk to Rachel and uh, make sure that we can nail the room? Okay, cool. So that's the plan. And the next Wednesday is the exam. Exam is closed book. It'll be held here. It'll be 80, 80 minutes, right? And uh, uh, you will be permitted a crib sheet. And it is one sheet, both sides. And I assure you, you don't need that much space. OK? Yep. Are the crib sheets going to be taken on the exam? Yes, you need to, huh? Actually, yeah, you can keep them, actually. You know what? You can keep them. We used to take them back, but keep them. It doesn't matter, right? You can make a Xerox copy, worst case. Right? So, OK, so let's start. 
Here's where we left off in the last class. We went through a horrible derivation. No, it wasn't horrible. It was, kind of, it was fun. I found it fun. But many of you slept through it. It's like a red eye, like the type I'll be taking tonight. And uh, what we ended up with, let's take a, a, a step back. Remember the, uh, remember that we had said earlier that if you have an ensemble of points and this is A and this ensemble of points we call it E and this is point I, oh, sorry J and this is point I and each point has a certain force on it. F I remember that um, we said that if you treat the whole thing as rigid you can show that the torque on the ensemble about point Q some point Q this is point O point Q is some other point right a truck you know driving down the road a satellite, whatever. We said that torque is equal to d by dt, a h, that's the angular momentum of ensemble E about point Q. This is the vector plus a v. Q cross A, the total angular, total linear momentum of the ensemble. Remember that formula? Right? And we said that's all great. But we said, listen, this guy, we need to figure out what this guy is in terms of the particles, in terms of you know the locations of the particles, the you know, and stuff like that. Right? In terms of how fast they're moving, right? That's kind of where we started the, the ugly derivation, right? And where the ugly derivation left off was here. What we derived was Confirm this. Ajay, was that a little p or a big p? Remember? Yeah, it was a big p. That means it's the momentum of the whole ensemble, obviously. No? Plus, don't worry, there's a pattern here. We'll simplify stuff. I is equal to 1. to n mi r qc this is actually qc i beg your pardon cross a omega b cross r ci where c is the center of mass of the ensemble so we said one of these points of all these points one of these points is a center of mass. And we refer to that as the center of mass of ensemble E, right? Sometimes we just call it C. Okay? Plus This is what we derived in all its glory in the class. Okay, so we're going to pick up here now. Do people remember what this term is? I. Ah, it's the moment of inertia, right? Now, I'll, 
you've done it in, the, in recitations, you've done it in previous classes. I'll only touch on it briefly here. But I is essentially uh, for a circle, right, a full circle, it's half. If the mass of the circle is m and the radius of the circle is r, what is it? Half m r squared. What is it for a hoop? Ha what is the i for a hoop? m r squared, right? For a rod, you can do it, right? It's 1 12th m l squared. So, okay, so that's i. We'll come back to that in a minute. But this is where we left it off. And in the recitations, I asked, I requested the recitation instructors to make sure you understood what i was for different shapes, right? Here we have treated the points as if they're individual point particle masses. But if you think of them as a continuum, right? It's just a kind of a smeared continuum of mass. Then you get the i that you're more familiar with, which is half m r squared for a circle, for example, for a disk. OK, anyway, this is where we left off. Now, this is the angular momentum. Really, what we're trying to do is we've calculated this. So we're going to try and reconstruct this equation. Right? We're trying to equate torque to the angular acceleration. So what we can do right now is the torque on ensemble E about point Q is equal to what? Come on. The derivative, that's it, yeah. So I'm just going to write it that way. I'm not going to take the derivative. A d by dt of this term plus d by dt a, right, of this term I'm not going to even bother to write it, plus what is the derivative of this guy? I alpha. I Are we missing any more terms? What? Surely we're missing some terms. Which, uh, which term have you missed? So which term? The pesky term. That's right. Now, this, you have to admit, is an utter mess, right? Before you took, the, took this class, before you started 2003, did you even know the existence of this and this and this? Did you, seriously? You didn't, right? But we went out and we did the math right royal, honesty with royal, with a lot of honesty and clarity, and that's what we end up with. Ajay, have I missed? Where? It's about the center of mass, the moment of inertia, i.e. C. Oh, that's right. Mm. That's right, yeah. Right? It's about the center of mass. Okay? So, what do we need to do to the terms? What would any self-respecting engineer do? Let's brainstorm a little bit. Go ahead. Anyone? Figure out the ones that are zero and get rid of them. Yeah. Here's what we're going to do. It turns out that if you take the angle, you know, the moment of inertia, and if you, if you try and use the, uh, the uh, take the torque about some random point, if you're not careful, you get into a lot of trouble. All right? So what we do now is we find the points Q about which many of these terms vanish. You understand? So, and it turns out that there are many, many complex conditions. For example, if the point Q is, you know, any point Q which is uh, accelerating towards the center of mass, and this happens, and that happens, yeah, you know, some terms cancel. But I'll give you the three 
most important things to keep in mind. If you walk away from this class and you remember these three things, A, you'll know that you know, these three points are important because you're ignoring those ugly terms and they only vanish for these three points. And B, you will have pretty much the three points that are important in formulating dynamic equations. All right? Those three points are, so there are three cases. where this equation simplifies, well, there are actually many more. There are only three cases that are important. Okay, And those three cases are, and I'll write the corresponding equation. And then, we'll, and then we'll solve some problems using this. One, anybody? I gave you a hint last time. What? Yeah, Q equal to C. Okay. And you can see when Q is equal to C, this term goes to zero because our QC is zero. This term will go to zero because RQC is equal to zero. This term will survive. And this term will go to zero because this velocity is, is parallel to this momentum. Got it? So V is equal to C. Sorry, Q is equal to C. And the corresponding equation is our beautiful, elegant, The Q, of course, is CE, so I might as well just write it as CE. Okay. The second simplification. Anybody? It's actually a tougher one. And I hinted at it last time. Anyone? Parallel velocity actually is good enough to cancel this term for a single particle, but the other two terms, not necessarily. Okay? So you're, you're right. For us, we ha you see this equation, kind of the little t, t, the tau, little h, little v, little p version of it, apply to, to particles. There, if they're parallel, you were good. But this is a more complicated beast here. So you can't slay this dragon with just that arrow in your quiver. It's a tough one. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not tough. It's an easy one, but I'll tell you. If the point Q is the instantaneous center of rotation. Remember that? We'll go through it again. Instantaneous center of rotation. If the point Q is the instantaneous center of rotation of a rigid body, then, so if Q is equal to the instantaneous center of rotation, we'll go into this in a little more detail in a second, then, and I'm going to write this in a subtle, you need to be very careful when the way I'm writing it, tau, oh, sorry, torque of the ensemble about, I'll just write ICR is equal to I of the ensemble about the ICR, get this? Okay, times A alpha B. Okay, that's the second point. If I do this, okay, let's say I have a, take my arm here, right? I have the, my, uh, this is the forearm, what is this called, the hind arm? I don't know, anyway. This section of my arm on the forearm, right? If my arm is doing this, right? The forearm, the, the, this part of the arm is, is swinging back and forth. And now I rotate my forearm as well. Right? First of all, what is the instantaneous center of rotation of this piece? Shoulder. What is the instantaneous center of my forearm? Trick question. Huh? It's not the shoulder. 
Is it the elbow? What do you think? Yes, right. The instantaneous center of rotation is not the first hinge you can find. The instantaneous center of rotation actually is kind of more complicated. What you really need to do is attach a large transparency to my arm, to my forearm, and find the point in the transparency that it's instantaneously not rotating, which is not actually this point, because this guy, this point is actually moving. See? Get it? For this rigid body, this point is still moving, right? <laughs> so actually, there's no nice, cute, instantaneous center rotation for this piece. You understand? So if you wanted to use the instantaneous center rotation, it works for this guy, but not that well for this guy. For this guy, you just want to use the center of mass. All right? The problem with that is when you use the center of mass, the hinge force, you know, the reaction force, the internal force of the hinge, you can't make it, you know, if, if, you, if you could have taken the, for, the torques about this point, those forces would have vanished, those unknown forces, right? It would be more convenient. You understand? Right? So the, you can't make them, you know, you can't conveniently make them vanish. You need to write them out as unknowns, spell them out, and figure them out. Right? That's the only thing. It's just more inconvenient. But this is not an instantaneous center of rotation. A lot of people think, oh, I can just take the torque about any hinge. No, cannot do that. You can only take torques about instantaneous center of rotation. Right? What is the instantaneous center of rotation of this door? Anybody? Yeah, so that's OK. So you can take torque, which is force times this distance, equal to I, which is the moment of inertia of this door about that axis, which is the moment of inertia about its center of mass, plus, using the parallel axis theorem, what? M d squared, right? So I, alpha. That you can do. But if it were a double door, right? And both were rotating, and the double, the double door part was rotating. You couldn't do t, 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 t equal i alpha about this point if, it is rot if it's moving, because instantaneously it's not, it is not the center of rotation. If this part were fixed and the double door were flapping back and forth, right, or if this part instantaneously had zero velocity, then that would be the instantaneous center of rotation of the second wing of the door. Get it? Get it? So very important that you think about it that way. If I give you a sheet. And I say, if I showed you a transparency, right? Let's say that there is a transparency. I'm going to erase this. Let's say that I give you a transpar I give you two points on a transparency, right? And the two points, it's point A and point B. And that's, you know, there's a transparency I'm holding up. These are points on the transparency. Then I move the transparency. Point A moves to here, and point B moves to here. How would you find the instantaneous central rotation? That's right, right? First of all, this is large motion, but if it were a small motion, you would, that's instantaneous center rotation. Get it? You understand? So you get the velocity at every point on the transparency and take the normals and where they meet, that's instant, instantaneous center rotation. I'm saying this to you because this is actually a powerful formula, but it's also a dangerous one because you'll be tempted to think that something is the ICR when it isn't. Are you good with this? Well, don't worry. We'll use this as an example. Now, the center of mass, you have no control over. It's where it is. The ICR, you have no control over. It's where it is. But let us say that you insisted on taking torques about some other point. Right? You might, you know, the joke I, I usually crack is that, let's say, you know, you're from Ohio. And you have to take torques about some point in Ohio. Right? It may not be the center of mass. It may not be the instantaneous center rotation. But grandmom is in Ohio, and by God, you want to take moments about Ohio. Right? There is a formula for that. And that formula is a third one. And that is, if Q is in Ohio, in other words, if it's a general point, then the formula is this. The torque on the ensemble about Q is equal to, very important, I of the ensemble about, this in, about the center of mass, A alpha B. And then those two, uh, the, all the three ugly terms reduced to this. Beautiful. R, um, Q, which is grandmom's home in Ohio, to the center of mass. Cross 
maas het ensemble okay so there are three these are the three simplifications okay and there's a kind of an intuitive way to do think about this if you're not taking it about the center of mass right then there's kind of an inertia force you know kind of a drag right across this inertia force is kind of an inertial torque that you need to put in you understand okay it's just kind of a correction term so there's a way to think about it intuitively but the intuition might let you down if you're not careful okay keep in mind though here i took the moment of inertia about the center of mass here i took it about the icr okay these are the three ways you can simplify this formula now what you might ask and go ahead and ask why do you need three ways go ahead and ask thank you the reason you need three ways is because it's all about convenience they're all in terms of information the same there's no difference at all you can solve every problem in any of the three ways and in fact we'll take one particular problem and skin the cat three ways it's a terrible expression i don't know where it comes from because i own a cat who okay anyway i mean it's my wife's cat but i still won't skin it um <laughs> the three ways you can do it right the reason is when you take torques you're taking cross products and if you find a convenient point you can make certain unknown forces that you don't care to find out go to zero right you won't get the same number of equations but if you can eliminate certain terms you have to solve fewer simultaneous equations you get it it's just a convenience thing that's all Does everyone have an intuitive feel of what I'm saying? Please raise your hands otherwise I'll say it again. Do people have an intuitive feel of what I'm saying? Okay, let's solve a problem and then we'll we'll address this. Okay, so the first problem we're going to solve and we're going to solve it three ways in the next R is rolling. Right? As I said, in law of classes that's a subject on its own in our class, it is but an example. Rolling. So the rolling problem consists of a uh, a circular disk in 2D sliding down a ramp. Actually it didn't mean be sliding down a ramp. It could be sliding under any circumstances, but we look at the situation where it's sliding down a ramp. Okay, let me make sure I use the same notation that I generally use. Okay, there you go. So let's assume that there is a ramp. The angle of the ramp is phi for what it's worth on the ramp is a disk a hockey puck how's that it's pretty good yeah did you know there's a contest for the most perfect circle you can draw and there's this one professor dude who draws incredible circles and if you go to youtube look go do a search for circle drawing and you should see this guy you know he kind of loosens his arm up arms up and i think he's like double jointed or something and he just draws a circle and it's perfect each time not a contest i would win or participate in but anyway okay this is the circle now first of all we're going to assume perfect rolling anyone remember what perfect rolling is no slipping what does that mean that's right that's right that means that whatever distance this moves the angle right it's like you have a string wound around this right so if it goes down the string's going to unwind so the angle is related to the distance traveled uh by the radius okay so we'll do that right now okay so what we'll do is let's assume i'm going to do it in a funny way i'm just going to assume that theta positive is this way all right i do it just to make a point which is i'm going to make assume it rolls uphill which clearly it doesn't right doesn't roll, roll up hill but i'm going to assume it does okay when i solve it it'll come out that it actually rolls downhill but the reason is i just want theta to point in the normal positive direction if it comes out negative so be it all right now first of all if i want to solve this problem and there's gravity it's got a mass but i want to start solving this problem it's a rigid body in two dimensional space how many degrees of freedom does it have overall Yeah. 
with or without the constraints, right? If you remove the constraints, a rigid body has three degrees of freedom. It can translate x, translate y, and rotate. What, the, what are the constraints on this guy? Very close. You're very close. I think what you mean is it can only, the tip, the bottom, must always contact this surface, is what you're saying, right? So one, one constraint is it can't move this way, right? But it's almost implicit. So when you want to, you know, you'll see when I write it out, that will be taken care of. The other constraint is the rolling constraint, which is that how much ever it rotates, it must be related to the distance it travels, right? So really, if you take those two constraints, and three degrees of freedom, the thing has only one degree of freedom remaining, right? Okay, so what should I do now to solve this guy? What should I do? We're going to, because I want to start getting into the rhythm of solving problems now. What should I do? What's the first step I need to, to take? Hmm? Well, the first step, kind of the, the first step I always say is draw the free body diagram, but there's a kind of a step zero before everything else, which is finish the labeling. So let's label this, right? So the label is, I'm going to call this distance L, and I'm going to assume the radius of this thing is R. Okay? So next step, draw the free body diagram. What are the forces on this guy? What? Gravity, so that's mg. What else? Normal force, which direction would it be in? Where is the normal force being applied precisely on the object? Where? At the bottom, right? So when you first draw the free body diagram, be very careful to label where the force is being applied because it, it might affect the torque, right? Let's call that normal force. Anything else? Friction. Could it slip without friction? Uh, it would slip. Could it roll without friction is what I meant to say. No, okay. All right. Okay, and theta is the angle. Okay. So your unknowns are going to be theta, f, and n. You'll get three equations of motion. You solve them, and you're solved. You solve the problem, right? All I care about is I want to know what the theta is going to be as a function of time. So really, I, only, I don't really care about f and n. All I care about is figure out for me Theta, an equation for theta, with the f and n eliminated. That's what I care about, right? But I could, you know, in some cases, I might care about f. I attended a talk by a guy from Michelin, the tire company, and their entire lives is spent analyzing f and n and the pressure on the tire, and it's very interesting, right? Um, anyway, but we don't care about that. But the problem is that in solving this, in writing out the equations, we'll end up having to care about f and n. All right, so let's talk about it. So how do we solve it? How do we solve, formulate the equations of motion for this guy? Anybody? <coughs> say, say it again? OK, so here's what we need to do. What are the three equations of motion for a rigid body? F is equal to ma in the x direction, in one direction, f is equal to ma in the y direction, whatever those two directions are. And what's the third one? Torque, right? OK. So which direction do you think we should be writing F is equal to MA in? Anybody? What's the convenient direction? OK, parallel to this. All right. So here's what we're going to do. So F is equal to MA. So let's assume that this is the A1 direction, and this is the A2 direction. So in the A1 direction, what is the net force in the x direction? By the way, what is this angle, anyone? Is it phi? Yeah. 
Okay? So in the A1 direction, that is in this direction, what is the total force on this rigid body? Come on, you know it, just say it. Help me here. Minus is equal to what? What was that? M what? A of what? A of this point, A of this point. Center of mass. So this is the center of mass. So what we care about is M. Say it again? Oh, I'm sorry. That should be a phi, yeah. Sorry. Right, M, A, of the center of mass. And you know that this is only going to accelerate, the center of mass is only going to accelerate in this direction. So I'm just going to call it A. Well, I'll leave out the frames and all that for the time being. OK? If you want, I can write this as A center of mass. But it's, you know, I'm taking the, the, because I'm already taking components, right, it's a scalar. So it's the A center of mass, right? A center. OK. In the A2 direction, what do I get? Look, it's very simple stuff. You know this. I just want you to go through it with me. I know it's a little boring, but we need to do it. So in the A2 direction, is equal to? Zero, because it's not accelerating in the A2 direction. OK, now I have three unknowns, n, f, and the third unknown is, is what? Theta. theta, right? So I need to somehow get theta into this, right? We'll bring it in. So the way we can get theta, the kinematic constraint <coughs> is this distance that is rolled down, L, right? So the way I can say it is A. I'm just going to write it, and I want you to understand it by intuiting it right now. Does that make sense? I want everyone to stare at this kinematic constraint. AC is equal to minus r th theta double dot. Where do I get that? L is equal to some constant, some constant minus r theta, right? L dot is equal to minus r theta dot. L double dot is equal to minus r theta double dot, right? Is everyone good? Are you good with this? OK. And so the kinematic constraint is AC is equal to minus r theta double dot, OK? Do I have enough to solve the problem? Anybody? Because the way I've written the equations, I actually have four unknowns. The unknowns are this guy, this guy, this guy and this guy, right? Just the way I wrote the equations. So I need a fourth equation. Where does the fourth equation come from? Torque, OK? So what is the total torque on this guy? First of all, let's pick a point. Now, which point should we take the torque about? OK. Now, if you take the torque about the center of mass, the problem is this F guy force, which is an unknown, which we, you know, it's an ugly force, we don't care about it, is going to show up explicitly, right? Wouldn't it have been more convenient to take the point about this point, the torque about this point, because both F and N would vanish, right? But can we? Is it the center of mass? In fact, it's the ICR, all right? But let's not do that right now. We know you can do it about the center of mass. Center of mass is always kosher. So let's do it about the center of mass, ugly as it might be. So let's do that now, right? So what is the torque about the center of mass? Anyone? So, sorry, say it again. Minus RF, right? Right hand rule. So it is R cross F. So this cross this is going to be negative. So it's going to be minus RF is equal to what? I alpha. Right? But what is alpha? Theta double dot. Theta double dot. 
Uh, so now we have four equations, four unknowns. We can solve the problem. I wrote it out this way just to kind of, look, it's pretty obvious what we're doing, right? But I wrote it out this way just to kind of show you that the unknowns might balloon depending on how you wrote the kinematic constraints. You might add one or two, but the kinematic constraints will compensate for them. You get it? Right? But you have four equations, four unknowns. And it's a very easy system to solve, which is the objective of the first snap quiz. Do it. So although it was more convenient to take moments about this point, which is perfectly valid because the center of mass, we chose to take moments about the center of mass. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, this is the in ICR. We chose to take moments about C. It just makes the equations more complicated, but the answer is going to be the same. So do it, and let's get the answer. This is approach one, by the way, where we take the moments about the center of mass, where the reference point is the center of mass. The question, the answer, what I'm trying to, I want you to solve for theta double dot, all right? Give me theta double dot. If anyone is struggling, let's get rid of AC and F. Put this, replace that AC with this guy. Okay, so all that's left in that term is F, and replace that F with this guy, and you've done. Right? One more minute. Good. How many of you are done? Okay. I'll give you another 30 seconds. If you're not done, you're probably just, um, you know, struggling with the uh, equations in terms of manipulating them. Nothing profound. Here's what's going to happen. The solution is very simple. Insert from equation four into one and insert from equation three into one 
and what you will get is mg sine phi minus Did I miss something? Oh, it's a plus here? OK, if you insist. OK. So you bring the theta double dot to one side, and you'll get what's the final answer? What's the answer? Well, let's, OK, I'll try and do it fast. Let me have a look. Okay, one person speak. What do you want to change? Here? <coughs> Everyone agree with that? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually that is correct. I had the negative in the wrong place. I was doing it in my head. All right, so theta double dot will come out to be what? Final answer. Negative mg sine phi. OK? Done. It's as simple as that. Question? You raise your arm. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so if you want to, absolutely. I is MR squared, right? Oh, sorry, half MR squared. So then this will become, you can simplify I, and it will become half MR squared. That will become three, 3 by 2 MR, right? And you can come up with the final answer. OK? The funny thing is, I don't care, care what the i is exactly. This formula still holds. For example, if we've got a hoop, right, this would be i would be mr, right? In fact, let me ask you a question. Based on this, if I gave you two circular entities of the same mass, one is a hoop and one is a solid disk, but the total mass is the same, which will accelerate faster? Which one? The solid mass will accelerate faster, right? Makes sense, because the inertia term will be less for a solid mass compared to a hoop, right? To your, to your point, right? Why is that intuitively? Yeah, you're concentrating more mass at the edge, right, in a hoop, so there's more resistance to rotation. Get it? The MR squared. There's an extra half MR squared there. Does everyone understand what I just said? What? OK. So we just solved this problem, soup to nuts, right, using approach one, where we use a center of mass. And the answer was OK, that was the final answer. That was approach one. Now, it's vaguely satisfying. Now let's do approach two quickly. We said it earlier, we hinted at it. What is the ICR of the rolling disk? Point of contact, right? Let me ask you a question. If that wedge was sitting in a truck and moving 100 miles an hour north, constant velocity, would the point P be an ICR? What do you think? Very good. So here's the deal. Very important, all right? There's a lesson in there. So you're exactly right. That is the ICR. But I put a twist into it. I said if you're seeing a truck heading north at a constant velocity, or east to west, it still works the same. The point is, an ICR is the instantaneous center of rotation 
of a rigid body with respect to an inertial frame. So you just attach the inertial frame to the truck, it would still become the ICR. However, now, if you're trying to find the ICR of some other rigid body, also in the same system, you better use that same truck. Get it? You understand? You pick one frame, and you can make that the ICR, but if in that truck there's another tiny truck heading some other direction with the same situation, that rolling, it won't be the ICR. You understand? Do people understand what I'm saying? There's only one. You get only one choice to pick an inertial frame, and it's an ICR in that frame. Everyone cool with this? Okay. Now, if it, was, if it were not perfect rolling, if it was slipping, would that be the ICR? Yes, no, or maybe. N yeah, if the disc were not, not like a gear, right? But we're kind of slipping a little bit and rolling, you know, slipping, rolling, slipping, rolling, skidding, right? Would the point of contact be the ICR? No, it would not. Where would the ICR be, kind of? Lower, under the floor, or higher? What do you think? It would be lower, all right? Now, imagine you're in a motorbike. Here, let me give you, a, give, give you another one. I'm in a motorbike, right? I flow the gas, the throttle, right? The wheels really start spinning in the same place. Where's the ICR? Center of mass. Get it? So when there's slippage, the ICR can move up or it can move down, right? If it's slipping in this situation, you know, it's kind of not rolling, but kind of slipping and rolling, it will move down. If I'm revving up an engine, right, and I'm kind of spinning my wheels, it's moving up. So the ICR is not always, but if it's perfect rolling, it is the point of contact. Everyone cool on this? Yes? Okay. So how do we solve this problem with the, for the ICR? What do we do? First of all, would the ICR be more convenient in this situation, yes or no? Yes, and the reason is, look, when we took the torque equation, we got this silly term here, right, RF, right, and F is an unknown. If we would taken the torque about the ICR, F and N, both the unknowns would have gone away, right? We, would still, we could still write equation one, so let's do it. So equation one, um, which is F is equal to MA in a one direction, same as above, right? Equation two, which is F is equal to MA in a two direction, same. Okay? What is the torque equation about the ICR? Somebody, anybody. What's the net torque about uh, on this rigid body about the instantaneous center of rotation? Quick, 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 quick. R what? R cross, R cross mg. That's right. And that would come out to be. But. Okay, and is that positive or negative? Yeah. So the torque equation is going to come out to be minus R M G sine phi is equal to I theta double dot. But where do we take the I about? That's right. I of the rigid body about the ICR times A alpha B, which is theta double dot, right? Right? Now, let's expand this. What is the moment of inertia of the, that rigid body about point P, not about its center of mass? Quick. Plus MR squared, right? So let's write that down. So let's write this equation down again. Minus I uh, minus R M G sine phi is equal to three by two M R squared, or the other way to write it is I'll write it in a more general way. It is 
I center of mass, which was just called I earlier, plus MR squared times theta double dot. Right? And what's the answer for theta double dot? Quick, it's the same, right? Is it the same? Thank God. I got different answers last year. It was very embarrassing. You know, all my derivations, my whole life flashed before my eyes. I, I questioned everything. My mother, done. Now, did I use equation one in doing this? Did I use equation one in solving? I could write it, but I didn't need to use it, right? Did I use equation two? No. I used equation three. Did I even use the kinematic constraint explicitly? Kind of not, right? So just using this, I got the answer. It's just a matter of convenience. It's a shortcut. That's all. And the judgment about the point Q, all it'll help you with is in solving the simultaneous equations more quickly. So that was what I was saying earlier. And I said, do you get, understand why certain points are more effective than other points in writing equations? You understand? This was just a trick. It's like, you know, if there's a knot, you pull the string at the right place, it just unties. This was it. That's it. Nothing profound. When in doubt, you can always take the center of mass. You'll have a few more terms, but you can solve it. Get it? Is everyone copacetic with this? Right? Everyone copacetic? Yes? OK? Here, what happened was, that of all the unknowns and all the knowns, you got one equation with one unknown. You solved it. Right? Now, there were three other equations and three other unknowns, but you didn't care about them. Right? Those were these three equations, and there were three unknowns embedded in there, but you didn't care about them. Now, if you had to calculate the normal force, you would have to have to go back and solve them anyway. OK? A lot of dynamics is really all about convenience. That's it. After you learn F is equal to MA, you can always solve the heck out of anything just by brute force. And a lot of dynamics is just simplifying the math. That's it. Even the concept of a moment of inertia is just a way to simplify the math for a lot of particles, right? Right? So is everyone good with this? OK. Now let's take on a bigger challenge, which is your grandmom. Right? All right, so the way grandma enters the equation here is you have a same situation, right, ball rolling downhill. I'm uh, sorry, not ball, a disk. Well, not bad, I'm having a good day today. Okay, all right. Now. This is the center. Check. We did that. Right? We just did, we did the first approach, which is solving the uh, equations using Q is equal to the center of mass. Got an answer. This is the ICR. Point P is the ICR. We did that. And we got the same answer, thankfully. Now let's pick some other point Q. And I could pick it anywhere. I could take this point and say tau is equal to I center of mass alpha plus the correction term, and it would be perfectly kosher. Right? But let's say that for now, you wouldn't do that. Why would you not pick this point? Yeah, why would you do it, right? It's just going to complicate your equations. There's no convenience to it, but it's perfectly reasonable. 
But let's say that for sentimental reasons, because you do have this aged relative who lives at point Q here, you want to take it about point Q, and we'll just do it. Let's have a go at it, OK? And let's say grandmom, and li grandmom lives in not too perverse a place. It's r below the surface, a distance r below the surface, just to make our math a little easier. OK? And let's see if we get the same answer. What do you think? Do you think we'll get the same answer? Yeah, of course, you know the script. OK. OK. So let's write the whole thing again. Does equation one change? Same. Equation two? The same. So what happens to equation three? We're taking torques about, we're going to call this point Q. Help me out here, folks. Say it, I'm sorry. I can't hear you. Well, well, okay, let's talk about it, right? You're just going to take the forces, all these forces, you're going to take torques about this point, right? Is n going to contribute? No, because r cross n and r, r and n are parallel, so it won't contribute. What will the, what will the contribution f be? Contribution of f is plus rf, right? OK. Any other torques on this guy? What? And then R, right? Let me write that neatly. I apologize. Minus 2R times mg sine phi is equal to? That's a net torque on this thing, right? What is I for this guy? Where do you take I about? Look at the, look at our, uh, which I should we consider? Center of mass. So what is, uh, that's just the same IC that we usually use. And we need this correction term, right? Right? So what's that going to, let me put it up there so you can stare at it. What's that correction term going to be? Think about it. I'm sorry? Well, OK, but just, uh, just w w yeah, exactly. It's exactly, right? Sorry, go back. Yeah, say it again. Uh, 2R. Well, look, it's very simple. Yeah, we have R theta double dot here, right? So it's going to be, that's right. It'll be 2R, that vector, cross MA which will be minus um, r theta double dot. Oh, I forgot the name, yeah. Is everyone good with this? I just took r cross ma. Right? A is minus r theta double dot. From there, we've already calculated it, right? And um, r is 2a1 r, right? r cross ma. Is, this, is the sign right? Yeah? And the fourth equation is the same as before. OK, and we now come to the last part of your uh, snap quiz, solve it. And for God's sake, please give me the same answer. 
So you know the answer, right? This should be plus? Yeah, actually, Ajay, thank you. That should be a plus, by the way. All right? It make, might make it easier. Take the cross product. Let me step back and see if I can see it from here. Okay. Uh, this is approach number three we're doing. So how many of you have got it? OK, for those who haven't, let me give you a very simple explanation of why this is right, why you'll get the same answer. Look at equation three, right? Equation one is the same as the top right board. Equation two is the same. Equation four is the same. Look at equ equation three. Is it the same as the equation on the equation three there? It's not, right? They're different. But if you stare at it, you will realize that equation three that we have here is actually a restatement of a couple of those equations, namely equation three here and equation one up there. You understand? If you double one multiplied by r and subtract it from three. So this is, in fact, the same as <coughs> minus two r times this plus this. Get it? So if you sort, you know, if you kind of shuffle equations, nothing changes. You get the same answer. And you can see why, therefore, you can kind of understand that the moment of inertia, you see this MA term, this R cross MA term, it kind of was like a parallel axis theorem at some level, kind of. Right? It's not really, OK, because it's not really a parallel axis. But it has the same effect. So essentially what this does is this equation, this set of equations, is equivalent to that set of equations. And when you solve it, as before, you're going to get done. Why is the last term positive? OK, so where did the last term come from? It was this term, right? So the way it would be is, it would be, let's write it out. R Q C E, let's write it in full vector form, is 2 R A 1. Sorry, A 2, I beg your pardon. That's what I had wrong, A 2, right? Cross M E. What is ACE? It is minus, so it's minus here, uh, R theta double dot times A1. A2 cross A1 is minus A3, and there's a negative here, so it'll become positive. Got it? <clears throat> so that's the origin of this guy. I was trying to do it in my head. And I put a negative in there, but Ajay and Sam caught me. It's actually a positive. And once you put it all in, the answer comes out to be the same. So those are the three ways in which you use torque and acceleration. OK? Now, it's very interesting. This was a system with one degree of freedom, really. Right? If you wrote the equations in the most, if you pick the most elegant approach, which was this one, you got one equation, one unknown, you were done. Brute force, the most inelegant approach, that's not the wrong approach. 
right? And in fact, in many ways, that is the most elegant approach because the same technique for every problem, right? You get four equations, four unknowns, right? And the reason you get four equations, four unknowns is because it's got three degrees of freedom plus a kinematic constraint, right? In fact, if you've written it even more brute force, it could be five equations, five unknowns, because you could even have said, well, I will state that the acceleration kind of perpendicular is an unknown and then state it equal to zero, right? So you get one more equation, one more unknown. Get it? Right? So in its most general sense, you might get a lot of equations, but you'll always get as many equations as there are unknowns. The smarter you are about picking the reference point to take talks about, the fewer unknowns you will have to deal with and fewer equations and get into your solution. But if you want to know all the hidden forces, all the reaction forces, all the internal forces, then you have to write it all out. Get it? If you solve for F using this, you'll figure out what the, 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 uh, the uh, friction force needs to be. And if you're designing tires, right, you need to know how much friction force the tread can support. Okay? If you, if you figure out N, you know what the air pressure in the tire needs to be in order that it doesn't bottom out, the tire doesn't bottom out, and the rim doesn't touch the ground. Right? So this is, you know, I, we attend, I attend this, this great talk by Michelin. Um, it's a very interesting thing. They've invented something called the twill. How many of you have heard of this? Twill. You heard about it? You heard about it? Tell me about the twill. Stand up, stand up. This is great. But I want everyone to hear about it. Go ahead. Yeah. It's a tire that doesn't have any air in it. That's right. So it turns out that Dunlop invented the rubber tire with air inside it in like 1898, right? And that's where the company Dunlop came from. A couple of years later, someone using, was using a Dunlop tire in France, and it burst. And there were two brothers who fixed it. Their last names were Michelin. That's where the company Michelin comes from. They're like, cool, we can make tires too, right? And for the last 100 years, every automobile um, worth its salt has used a air hose tire. And now Michelin has invented a new tire. In fact, I, showing the, I showed Ajay the, uh, the uh, design a few, uh, about a few months ago. Essentially, what they do is they have the tire, and then instead of putting air you know, between the inside and the outside, they put these little kind of spoky things. They look like spokes. They're not spokes, OK? And you get this. And when, when you get contact, you get a little bit of shear, which you, you will see in 2001. And it, it, it kind of flexes like a tire, or it kind of spreads out. And the beauty of this is it has no air, so it can't go flat. It's great in military applications, et cetera. But number two, it actually, if you do it right, it could be more efficient and cheaper than a tire. And it might actually reduce power consumption by like 5%, 3% power wastage because tires stretch, right? Brilliant stuff. Right? And already, you know, the, you know the Segway scooter, right? Segway is only two tires. If one of them blows out, you fall over. Right? So they're already thinking of using this. Many forklift trucks, et cetera, they're going to this. So I said they came and gave a presentation. And you know where they started? This stuff. And they calculate the normal force. <laughs> they calculate the friction force. And then try and figure out how much pressure you need. What the so it all starts here, right? So I hope now you're very com clear about the three approaches and that they're all the same. It's all a matter of convenience. Next week, Ajay is going to cover energy. Very simply, very basic energy. And then we'll solve problems. Saturday, 3 PM, you'll see me here again. And Monday, we'll do more problems. And I'll be a little more, I'll give you a technique for solving problems that's, I think, pretty good. OK, see you guys. <laughs>